Hello and welcome to Apostolate of the Ear, where we aim to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I'm your host, Sean Mitchell, and joining me today is Dr. Jordan Daniel Wood. Jordan holds a PhD in historical theology from Boston College, and he's the author of The Whole Mystery of Christ, Creation is Incarnation, and Maximus the Confessor. And he's also currently translating the letters of St. Maximus. So, Jordan, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show today. It's great to be here with you, Sean. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So, for the listeners, what, what Jordan and I are going to be discussing is the topic of universalism. Um, and I know uh, that I have probably listened to everything that Jordan has out there on universalism. Um, he has a good bit out on YouTube, um, and it's really uh, fa fantastic work. So I was interested in in, in bringing you on for, for that reason. Um, <clears throat> and also for the listeners, universalism is, you know, the, the, the doctrine that all persons will ultimately be saved. Now, some universalists, and perhaps we can find out if this is the case for, for Jordan, would extend that to all rational creatures, um, all creation, right? It's kind of a, 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 a cosmic doctrine where, it, so universalism can sometimes bleed into apocatastasis. But in any case, um, our, our main focus is the question of will all persons be saved um, so that will be our, 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 the focus of our discussion today. So Jordan, I think, um, you know, as I thought about this topic, and let me just, I guess, be, be open from the outset. I, I am convinced of the arguments in favor of universalism. <laughs> I have tried in some ways to uh, convince myself otherwise and have been unsuccessful in, in, in doing so. Actually, just last night, um, taking some time in prayer and just struggling to find any way out of where I've come. Um, but I do think that it's important to recognize that there are sophisticated and intellectual um, and uh, serious objections to universalism that do need to be wrestled with um if nothing else because they do show a certain kind of intellectual rigor even though i don't agree with the the, the ultimate argument so one that i want to bring up and i'm going to articulate it as best i can and then i'd like to get your response but it's <clears throat> what is sometimes called uh post-mortem fixity of the will um which is more more or less what it sounds like so let me explain my understanding of that and this is particularly uh, a, a, a Thomist understanding that, um, in particular, like Ed Fazer would 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 advocate for. Then I'd like to get get your response. So there's actually an article out there by Ed Fazer, um, kind of unhappily titled "How to Go to Hell," um, <laughs> but uh, it 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 he starts by uh, speaking of obstinate angelic wills um, to set up. Uh, his kind of the framework for thinking about how humans go to hell. He talks about how an angel is an incorporeal mind. They don't have a body. They don't have passions like us. They don't reason discursively from premises to conclusions, but they understand um, all at once. They don't have any appetites that could pull them in any opposite uh, direction from what their will conceives as the good or their intellect conceives as the good, and so they will. And therefore, when an angel makes a choice, uh, that choice on the basis of their own nature, uh, being such that uh, you know they do know all at once, um, is final, definitive, eternal, and he would even say irreversible, such that not even God could reverse it because it is a metaphysical impossibility to reverse it. And so he sets that up to say, well, the human being is is uh, different in that he has this element of incorporeal intellect and will, the soul, but he also has a body. So the human being does uh, 
reason discursively from premises to conclusions. He does have passions and appetites that can um, uh, uh, pull him away from the good. And so the human being doesn't know all at once. He can be in error about the good. He can make decisions, you know, uh, uh, on the basis of some fleeting passion that are poor decisions for that reason. Um, but in this life, um, he can ultimately overcome through the grace of God, uh, you know, passions and appetites and so forth that pull him in, in, in the wrong direction. But if he spends an entire life, say, giving in to the appetite of uh, sexual pleasure or uh, love of money or whatever might be the case, um, he will have uh, conditioned his soul such that when the soul is separated from the body and is in a position then to make a definitive choice, because then in, in his telling of it is essentially the same as, as an angel, um, his soul will be so conditioned by the way he is he lived life in the body that it is more than likely that he will opt for one of those lesser goods as his ultimate good and that decision given that now the soul is divorced from the body will be uh, uh, ultimate eternal definitive so i don't want to go on too long but i'd say one last thing so i'm reading this and i'm thinking okay well what about the resurrection of the body does that does that do anything and his his framing of that is no. And he says that Aquinas answer is no. And the reason that he says that that's the case is because the the body then essentially uh, is it, it takes on the form of the soul. So he kind of said, like, if you have wet clay that can be uh, it, it can be molded, but once it is molded, um, you know, if you put it into water, water takes on the shape of that that clay instead of vice versa. And the same happens with, you know, the body that then reunites with the soul at, at the resurrection of the body. So his answer in that case is not even the resurrection of the body would make any difference to the state of this soul. So I have a couple of my own objections, but that's not what this is about. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are in response. And I know that was a lot, uh, so you don't have to take a stab at every piece of it but i'd like to hear your thoughts and response yeah so a few, a few several things come to mind i've actually i think i've read the article that you mentioned uh, yep. and i want to mention another article that's a nice counterpoint although it's not directly targeting that article because they kind of came out at the same time around the same time but there's another catholic theologian ty monroe who has written who has published an article in hate journal last year called I think it's called like anthropology ontology and the possibility of postmortem convert conversion or repentance or something um and he actually his whole thing is directly to uh engage and expose what he tries to argue as the internal tensions within thomas's own view so i recommend you know people take a look at that as as, as well as phasers you know to kind of see two two different people directly addressing almost exact same texts from thomas but with quite different assessments um so what comes to mind okay first of all um <clears throat> let's just grant because i know the way phaser uh, frames the article he's he is explicitly trying to say this is an argument from reason um you know quite apart from authority or what thomas thinks scripture teaches or augustine or whatever even though of course it's in line with that stuff um as thomas understands it but uh, Phaser's argument and a lot of Thomist arguments today do claim that like re like a philosophical metaphysical argument alone is sufficient um, to come to the conclusion of a um, the fixity of the will beyond death. I think that's already a little bit questionable, even just in in, in terms of the uh, historical context of scholasticism, because Thomas's view of the angels is definitely not the only one. I mean, even its metaphysical makeup, you got you got someone like St. Bonaventure who holds to what's called universal hylomorphism, which would claim more in line, by the way, with earlier Greek fathers, that even angels have some kind of body. And so, so much of the argument rests on the idea that an incor incorporeal intellect, as it were, doesn't have successions of acts, that the, succession, the, the successiveness of acts, the one after another, the piecemeal, the dialectic, 
the gnomic, you know, uh, reasoning back and forth to come to the right con sure conclusion. That is a feature specific to embodied existence. Um, and so the idea would be first, like you said, an, an angel, if, it, if the angel is, quote, absolutely incorporeal or, or something like that, or essentially incorporeal, uh, however they want to put it, that the angel then would not go through successions of acts, but would go through, as it were, almost like one comprehensive act, judgment, one judgment. Um, and, and then I guess by, by extension or almost by analogy, or sometimes the blurred, the post, you know, the post death separated soul that say Benedictus Deus teaches, um, in the 14th century, that, that, that text that says, yes, in fact, when you die, you do have a separated soul now makes you more like an angelic nature so that. But you're kind of more in a double bind, right? If you're a, if you're a, if you're a, a soul that's destined or, or that's damned after um, after death, and your 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 will is fixed on evil, you're double. You're more like it's like an almost in, in a way it's a, a worse bind than the original angel, although you end up in the same place on this view. First, because you have the you do have a history of successive acts in the body, like you said, that's habituated you towards you know choosing lesser evil or lesser goods above the good or basically choosing evil um and so there's from that perspective you're kind of already on the far 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 down the wrong path and so there's even there's little hope but then but then you add to that that kind of as it were and even in the commentary tradition on thomas there's two different there's an argument over this like when does this fixity happen does it happen at the last moment of death prior to the departure of the soul of the body or like is the first thing the departed soul does and like Kajitan takes one view or whatever. So there's this argument in, in the commentatorial tradition. <clears throat> but um, but the point would be, however you get there, um, you would say um, not only does that soul have a, a history of embodied habituation to evil, but that then when that soul is departed, it becomes like, uh, sufficiently like an angelic nature that makes, say, a, an entire single comprehensive fixed decision against God and for lesser goods or something like that. And so that's almost a worse situation, like there's less hope. Um, so like you said, by the time you get to the resurrection, right, it's like almost the resurrection, which is kind of curious, I should note here, the resurrection has no effect on the history of a damned soul. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of remarkable. I mean, the reintegration of body and uh, body and soul, such that you become a complete human being again, has literally no effect on your soul. Which and can, is, do you mind if I stop there for just yeah, one ahead. second with a question? What What I thought was especially curious is, you know, so Phaser sets up the his approach with you know angelic wills, and then he goes into how when the human soul separates from the body. He 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 is essentially saying the exact same thing. So let's let's say we accept the angelic nature thing and everything he says okay, about yeah. it, right? Yeah. So he's essentially saying that the human being, the human soul, is going to um, act in exactly the same way as an angelic nature would. But he also says that the human soul, divorced from the body, is an incomplete substance. It, and which so is also true metaphysically on Thomas's view, yeah. Right. And so what what's very interesting is if it's an incomplete substance, it's got to be in some way different from an angel who is a complete substance as an incorporeal intellect and will. And so the, the question then became for me, OK, I, I can I'm not saying I do buy this, but let's just say I buy the idea that there's incorporeal, uh, fully incorporeal intellect and will. That's the angel. It makes a definitive choice. It's absolute, eternal, irreversible, metaphysically, et cetera. Well, I, it's hard for me to think that an incomplete substance could then also make so definitive and so absolute a choice. Um, mm -hmm. So you can't make it a one to one um, yeah. if you're saying that the angel, that the human soul is an incomplete substance without the body. So anyways, that's just I didn't mean to. No, that's that. no, that's right. And that's that's one of those that it would it would make a I mean. <laughs> It would make a um, it's a severe qualification on the idea of the fixity. What's the character of the fixity of the separated soul? Precisely right. because, as you're saying, even on that metaphysical scheme, by definition, 
So this is why that that internal debate arose, partly why, right? Because one side would say, well, you couldn't make a sufficiently human act or decision as a separated soul. And so it must be the last moment before death mm. that then fixes the soul. And kind of your death is almost just a stamp on what you just already did. And then, the, but then there's the other view that's like, well, but the problem with that is if that is also embodied, it can't be comprehensive. Because it's just it's just the last successive act you made, not somehow qualitatively different from any prior act. So it must be that the separated soul is sufficiently like angelic that it could make a sufficiently comprehensive act right after upon its death and separation. So this it's so that very debate exposes, I think, a pretty deep anthropological, metaphysical, uh, let's just say tension to be kind, if not incoherence. So there's that. But e even if like so I just wanted to, I also wanted to just make the point that um, the kind of idea that, you know, or, or the sort of just sort of assertion that we we have to, like, again, because we're bracketing on his view, we're bracketing, we don't need to do the scriptural arguments or the theological tradition or anything like that. We can argue simply from the metaphysical makeup of the angel. Well, the, then the problem is, if that's going to, where you're going to rest your case, why not, why not choose many of the other even medieval uh, uh, angelologies out there that had quite a different view of the metaphysical makeup of the angel? Mm -hmm. um, for for one thing, there got, it should shouldn't really be controversial. That the only thing that's absolutely incorporeal is the divine essence. So a created angel is certainly not absolutely incorporeal. If what you mean by absolute is the exact same essential quality as the divine, um, so there's that, and that's already been that was even noted again in the early Middle Ages by, by somebody like Ariugena, who is very clear about the different levels and the relative corporealities of angels. And I get he's controversial as well, but just as a kind of historical uh, testimony to that diversity right there at the beginning of the Middle Ages. And as I said, the universal hylomorphism was not a that's not a minority view in the in the Middle Ages. Um, and so even angels, the idea that even angels have some kind of body, but relative to our type of body seems incorporeal to us. So anyway, the point is you could you could even get in the weeds of the metaphysics of angel angelic nature. And it's so the idea that we just have we can just accept that it's sort of the the obvious conclusion or perspective of like unaided by grace reason to take Thomas's particular uh, angelology seems to be arbitrary to me. But um, but then the but the, the, there's a few further points. Let's even just say we do. Let's just take that as the kind of yes, this is the one and only view of the metaphysics of uh, of being an angel. I still think there are two really crucial conditions that render the idea that the angel had a sufficiently comprehensive, that is totally knowledgeable, um, uh, act even in its primordial act against God or for or against God. Mm -hmm. The one is that um. I take, again, a different part of the tradition uh, that's testified to a lot in the Greek Fathers. St. Maximus says this, St. John of Damascus. And that is that um, angels don't know everything about God just by virtue of being angels. And one of the things they didn't know about God was, was that God could be incarnate. Uh, and so they actually learn something about God's self-revelation from that event, event that act of, of God's revealing himself as human. Um, and so, but, but then that's, that becomes very interesting because if you think through that a little bit, if they didn't know God could be human, that's probably because they didn't sufficiently know what it would mean for God to be triune. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know God is triune, well, at some point you might just say they don't know God. So, uh, the idea that they are primordial act just because they were left, they were not encumbered by the embodied existence in that type of finitude somehow means they they completely knew with perspicacity like everything there is to know in this one whole instantaneous comprehensive judgment was is simply not necessary it's not a necessary conclusion whatsoever and it seems like if you're going to say that god as father son and spirit was disclosed through the self-revelation of god through the incarnation even to the angels you know, even to all creation, so that we can preach the gospel to all creation, as it says in the end of Mark. Then, um, then it wouldn't be the case that they made that their prime, even their primordial judgment was with sufficient, like, complete, total knowledge. Now, it's sufficient for punishment. It's sufficient for 
you know, everything that comes, like, so no, just to throw it out there for, I'm sure people already know, but you, no universalist that I've ever read in the Christian tradition of any era would de- would deny divine punishment, divine judgment, suffering, all the stuff that's necessary and in, 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 within, uh, that's inherent in the spiritual life, the life of labor, <clears throat> asceticism, cleaving to God by grace through the sacrament, all that stuff. So, it's not that they don't have consequences, and it's not that their consequences wouldn't be of a qualitatively different degree than an embodied. No, all of that is fine, mm-hmm. but that's not the argument. The argument wasn't um, they made a primordial error that was that was self-destructive and had all these ramifications. The argument, at least as presented by a lot of Thomas, is they made a comprehensive judgment that's like misunderstanding first principles. That's how devastating and d- deep it is. In fact, Thomas, is, in one text, uses the example of, um, you know, just as your judgment that the whole is greater than the part is like self-sufficient or self-evident, right? It's like a, it's a judgment of reason that if you don't get that right, if you can't see that, at the see the truth of it, then that's not not only uh, going to make you mistake all, a whole host of other things that that principle, like you knowing that principle would depend upon, like particular judgments, but it also just shows the depths of your of your error and of, and just how far you are from the truth kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So that leads to a second condition that I think <clears throat> is, in, uh, is not really taken into account, even on the strong um, Thomistic view, and it's this. You could... Nobody, not even a, an angel, could make a judgment about God that's akin to a what I would call a judgment about first principles, if you want to go really pre-modern. Uh, a judgment about first principles within gene, genera. Mm-hmm. Right? So, they, so, they, so it's like, if you want to make a judgment about the very nature of the human being, you need to know what the genus and species of human being is and what those fun, like what is rationality, right? And this like, cause that characterizes the whole genus. Um, and so, uh, or, or the judgment of whole and part, you know, that would be something like you in a certain way, even more fundamental. But if you're, but if, if, if you're, if you're going to liken that kind of judgment of the prim- the primordial error of the angels or, or rebellion against the angels in that way, then you basically have to be implicitly uh, characterizing God as a genius. But of course, God is above every essence. Right. Yep. God is certainly not a genius. Being itself on Thomas's view is not a genius. So um, how could you make an error about, so- how could you make a judgment about something which is by nature above all genera that is like a, a, a generic error. So in hmm. other words, their act of judgment about God, because assu- assumingly the whole truth of things would include God, um, has to be one that, yes, could be culpable. It's, it could be wrong, could have all these deep primordial ramifications. But I don't see how it could, how it could constitute or count for uh, a comprehensive knowing and rejection of God as he is. Mm-hmm. That's the last little point I'll make on this is that surely we don't want to say, even on an atomistic frame, uh, uh, with an atomistic basis, um, surely we don't want to say that the angels, however, however less encumbered they are than we are currently now uh, in their perception of God or pursuit of God or desire for God, surely we don't want to say that, that they knew God completely and rejected him. Because if they knew God totally, entirely, almost like the beatific vision itself, and rejected him, then that means God is not <clears throat> fundamentally is not fundamentally the object of our own desire. And this is where a certain kind of Thomism comes in and necessitates, right? When Thomas says that the, the angels were, actually he says in their potent, they did have a potency for supernatural goods. What he's saying is that the angels even needed this the, like like something like supernatural grace to even desire and appropriately know and cleave to the supernatural goods to which they were ordered hmm. um so first of all again that's a kind of he's at least admitting some movement right there's a potency he calls it a potency potency to act um but the other thing is that um uh you're stuck then with the kind of typical two-tier problem um where it's like well 
either they did have the sufficient grace, the gift that gave them the supernatural potency or whatever to 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 uh, to reduce to act their desire for God's beatific vision, and yet they still didn't accept it. Which then brings in a lot of questions about the efficacy of grace, the uh, sufficiency of grace to form the desire, which is itself fulfilled by God alone, right? all that stuff. Or else they didn't totally have it, and somehow that's because they resisted it, or like so they. But but then that would mean they didn't have the potency in the first place, or they didn't sufficiently have it. So it's it's that same old problem of how does grace actually relate to. Not just the desire for, but the enacting and the seeing and the the knowing desire <laughs> and accomplishment of um, uh, of the rational being for God. So, all to say, I I think for a, a lot of those reasons, I, I what I would what I don't think is clear, I should say, is that there is a permanent absolute fixity based on and and as an inherent implication of sort of the metaphysics of this primordial act. I don't see that. If it was, if it, because you basically need to make it a totally comprehensive and self corrupting judgment, which corrupts all other judgments. But for the reasons I just mentioned, you know, the fact that God wasn't known by the angels and disclosed himself to them further and more clearly in his re- revelation, the fact that the judgment couldn't be like, sufficiently like a generic judgment or error, precisely because God isn't a genius. Uh, so that means there's another way to know God more fully that does not conform to that sort of judgment about, say, pull, whole in parts or two plus two is four or the law of canon contradiction. Uh, and then also this this uh, further point about the role of grace. So uh, for all those reasons, I think it's even on the strongest case for the fixity of the will based on an analogy or an extrapolation from the angelic primordial error. I just, it's not clear to me at all that 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 uh, is the kind of judgment they need it to be in order to make that kind of conclusion. Yeah, that um, <clears throat> that makes sense. And I do think that that, you know, I, I didn't even mention it when I asked the question, but that was one thing that troubled me is, in fact, and I'm, I'm not remembering exactly how um, Phaser lays it out, but he essentially does say that Angels also can be an error about what their ultimate good is. So he actually flat out admits, like, yeah. they are an error, um, and they can make a decision on the basis of that error. And then that decision is absolute, eternal, definitive, fixed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that uh, appears to be a problem with me, especially because the way in which he phrases it is, the angel makes this this decision at the moment of their creation. So it's like, okay, right. so God creates something that at the moment he has created it, knows it will be damned for all eternity. It's not right. like, it, it, it becomes a little bit more, diff, like you can argue a little bit better on the basis of humans because we have at least, you know, 70, 80, whatever, <laughs> however many years, the angel at the moment of his creation is damned. It's like that. That sounds like a. And I I know that, that a lot of Catholics want to avoid this because what we have in the in, in the tradition. But what I was about to say is that sounds like a mon- a monstrous god to me. Um, I I don't really know any other way around that. Um, <clears throat> so in, in any case, um, yeah. And just just as a note here, it's interesting to see that. The structure of that kind of argument is actually formally identical to the structure of a certain kind of argument from original sin. And in this way, you in both cases, you have a first and totally uh, consequential and comprehensive act or error or rebellion, a sin. And then everything that follows it has like a different logic altogether and you're so you're enclosed in this sort of never ending dialectical loop of delusion. Right. So so in the case of the for, for Thomas and the Angels, like you said, the moment they're created, there's this act, and they then that it that has the total perpetual effect of fixing them till the very eschatological end, right? Whereas like on a certain Augustinian view of uh, of of original sin, you've got the first parents who are not obstructed by the things that all their pro- progeny are, but they make a primordial error. 
uh, and that has ramification. Now, it's not the exact same as the angelic, right? But it basically everyone is now born in original sin. Everyone is born with the need for for grace in a way that they weren't maybe even primordially, even if they needed some kind of grace uh, for the justice of the soul. I bring that up because not because it's just like, oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, there is an interesting point to say, like, um, there's a kind of like simplistic story character to um, to both of those views. And, and it has a tool, dual function. One would be to protect God from having made a bad creation. So at least the first moment wasn't so bad. <laughs> and then immediately after it all goes off the rails. But somehow he's like let off the hook because at least his like what immediately proceeded from his will wasn't itself corrupt. Even though basically the very ins- the next instant it is or something, I don't know. Like you're saying, I don't know if that really helps. I don't see how that makes God more competent or more more loving or more merciful. It looks like he's just couldn't see the next step. Um, but the but the other thing is um, the discussion about salvation, given the Christian framework, given the fact that we can all admit that we live in a world which, as the New Testament says, right has has a different prince ruling it. Given that we have uh, that we are born in sin and structures, born in ignorance, as Maxus would say, in ig- uh, ignorance of God, which, which births self-love, which births, births tyranny. Given that these are the shackles within which our existence current, the, the question is not for a universalist. So, given the metaphysical essence of a human being or of, a, of an angel, how exa- what exactly is possible? No. The question is, what can God's grace do? Yes. Yeah. And and the and the question is, can it get even to those of us that are not not we're not even human, we're less than human. We don't even approximate the fullness of yes, we're in potency human, but that's the same thing as saying we're not yet human, because you have to reduce the potency to act. So um so it isn't sufficient to just sit back and make these analytic points about human freedom in the abstract angelic freedom and primordial freedom in the abstract, the character of their judgment based on their metaphysical makeup in the abstract, and then say, so, you know, you can see eschatological fixity. It's like, well, no, I mean, um, so when Maximus talks about the harrowing of hell, um, he will talk about the the bars that shackle the bad angels and uh, humans in hell as eternal. And he says these are their material, like their sinful attachment to material things. Uh, so he's got this whole like rich view of sin, right? That's that's very harrowing in a lot of ways. But the point in, that I, that I want to bring out here is, he thinks that the descent of hell breaks the bonds. So there's something eternal, which can nevertheless be reversed. Right. That's a paradox, but only from a certain perspective. It's a paradox. If all you're doing is thinking through metaphysical essences as you perceive them and their and their possibilities and limitations, then that looks impossible. How could something eternal be reversed? Right. But then if you're thinking about the act, the actions of God, the activity of grace, the depths of love and 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 harrowing hell and descending to hell itself, um, that makes possibilities which from a quote-unquote natural or metaphysical perspective do seem absurd on the face. But, you know, welcome to the kingdom of grace. There's a whole lot of absurdities to go around for the good. Right. So that's so that's the kind of thing that's like, um, I just want to point that out because I very often think that the debates get bogged down in, you know, this kind of, well, what's possible for the human being as such? What's possible in a, a, when you think about the human being departed from you know, the split between soul and body and its separate, its soul sort of separately existing apart from the body post-mortem, given the the makeup of angels as we think we perceive them. Um, okay, I mean, but none of that, I mean, it's just so interesting how it all floats so free from any actual activity of God making any difference. Yeah. When, when God joins the soul and body back together in the general resurrection, it makes no difference. You've made all the difference because of your evil and your evil history. Mm-hmm. When, 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 when Christ descends to hell, well, since they've all, everyone in hell has already had this history and fixity, blah, 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 it makes no difference for them. You make all the difference because you put yourself in hell through blah, blah, blah. Like, so it's just so interesting to see how at every moment when God does a decisive act, it seems to have no effect whatsoever on anyone in particular. Mm. Yes, and that's, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into this, but that's 
it's actually when I said, you know, last night I was thinking and struggling. I like, can I can I find a way out of this? Not that I particularly want to, but I am trying to like intellectually wrestle yeah. with the other positions. And um, <clears throat> I thought I'd like if on the basis of a traditional doctrine of hell, um, I literally have to admit the possibility that myself and anyone around me potentially i think i think i heard you say this in an interview potentially all <laughs> could be damned right right um right. then I, it's it's just i lose all motivation to love god at that point i i do i, I just don't i don't really see how um that can be something that uh, gives me kind of an inner, an inner drive to um, love God as my final end. Um, so, yeah, I think that, I think that that obviously um, uh, poses a difficulty. And, but I, I also think I'm, I'm so glad you brought up and we emailed a little bit about this, but the point about like <clears throat> what people often see as the most fundamental in, in this, uh, in this debate. Right. Um, like you said, what's possible metaphysically, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's really what what they're looking at. And whenever something doesn't make sense on the face of it, something eternal being reversed, it's, it's dropped as an impossibility. Whereas we do hear with God, all things are possible. Right. So, so that, that's interesting. Um, But I think there are a couple of things to say in response to that. And I'd like to get your thoughts. Um, one is, I mean, in Christ, the infinite became finite. The eternal became temporal <laughs> at the resurrection, right? So that's right there. We've seen those paradoxes, those seeming impossibilities actually become uh, flesh in Jesus Christ. So... <laughs> It seems to me that we, I'm not sure that we can admit those as absolute impossibilities when, I mean, perhaps the most central um, element of our faith, the incarnation, uh, basically says, well, those aren't impossibilities, right? So so that's one thing. Go ahead. Well, it's just, it's I, just a quick remark. It's, I, I, <laughs> I can't, I can't pass it up. It's. We see exactly what you said, the sort of, I mean, there's a reason why a lot of other religious traditions, and even within the Christian tradition, there's been so much debate and resistance to the very idea of incarnation, precisely because it's so easy from a metaphysical perspective to say that's absurd. Why would would that even be possible? But like you're saying, we see it, behold, right? But the same God who becomes flesh also then tells you, you will see greater things than these. Yes. Yes. And then the yeah. same the same early generation will write like say in Ephesians three, he to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. To him be all glory and right. It's so funny though because if it looks to me like our so often our theology is that God did something amazing, blowing our mind, paradoxical, defying what we thought was metaphysically possible in His very being in the incarnation but that but then the way we assess and describe the potential of the effect the final effect and achievement of that same incarnation is so much more diminished it turns out that the effect of the incarnation is not only not as paradoxical and and wondrous as the original act of the incarnation but is in, in fact totally banal because it does almost nothing for for actual people instead it's like well God became human so that you might have a choice. <laughs> I mean, right. we already had a choice. Like, what's the, like, where's the, you know, so it's like, no, I, I get it. Look, I get it. There's in, there's a lot of theology about, there's the theologies of grace and there's efficient grace and there's prevenient grace. I, I get it. There's, it's like, well, he does more. He does some things more. Okay, but look, guys, at the end of the day, after all the distinctions and after all your qualifications and all your invisible helps that God sort of adds apparently that we have to think through, the effect, the only effect that matters, that is the eternal one, 
the one that makes literally absolute difference is totally banal on that account. And the Christ incarnation has done, it may as well have done nothing. Because for the damned, it literally do, it doesn't accomplish what it's sent out to do. So I just, it's just one of those, again, where it's like, I think doxologically you can get there. I, I remember having one monk tell me that when he heard I was a universalist, you know, and he's like a Benedictine monk or whatever or somewhere. He's like, yeah, I just kind of think like in prayer, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> like kind of what you were saying, right? And but I but I think it's not just like a cheap sentimental non-intellectual thing. There's actually a profound intellectual point there, which is that um, are all the stuff are all the things we say of God and worship and liturgy and prayer are they really true? Right. Can he do more than we can ask or imagine? Does he want all to be saved? Can he outwit even the great? you know, deceiver himself, like as St. Gregory of Nyssa says? Or or is he just kind of like another force that may tip the scales for some people in one direction, but still it's ultimately you and your totally free, ignorant choice that makes the real difference? I don't know. I'm just riffing there. I'm sorry to, but no. go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. No, I'm I'm very glad you said that because this... This does get into, as I said, what we kind of emailed about, where I, I had I had said to you, I, I, I think that there is a certain type of fundamentalism that Catholics should hold to, and it's what I would call a God fundamentalism, by which I mean that <clears throat> the church must assess the soundness of her doctoral um, uh, uh, formulations according to the reality that is God, right? So there there and and by the way, like there's a there's a deep reason for that. So you say that and people are like, well what does that mean? Well for one thing, we wouldn't even the we wouldn't even say that God is the the most real thing. We would say that God is reality itself. So of course everything needs to be measured on that basis, right? And then we ask, okay, God is reality itself. What do we say about God? Well, and this came up in your recent debate, but and I think it actually is a really good argument. Is well, God is uh, omnipotent and omnibenevolent and desires the salvation of all, and He's omniscient and so knows how to save. Um, and so, all that being true. What would it make of God if then not all are saved, right? It you you really have to ask the question: um, Can all that be true if, in fact, not all are saved? And I have a hard time saying that 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 it that it could be true. Um, and then so that's all kind of um, uh, I guess it's not generic to your point earlier, but those, those kind of generic things you can say about God: He's omnibenevolent, He's omnipotent, He's omniscient. And then he desires the salvation of all. That's from scripture. That's more of kind of, a, I, I guess, a, a revelational thing. But in any case, you could say all that about God, right? But then you look at um, <clears throat> the, the incarnation, which we were just talking about a moment ago. And th this is something that, uh, if you really think about it, I think on traditional grounds, you could even make a good argument. And this is what I said I wanted to perhaps talk about for like apocatosis, the actual restoration of all things, of all creation. And, and here's why I would say so, and I, and I would like to get your thoughts. Traditionally, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is just what I have heard. I, I'm not <clears throat> like so deeply read in all this stuff. But traditionally, man is thought of as a microcosm of all creation, right? And so, you know, there might be some people that would say the incarnation doesn't have effect on angels right because angels are not men and christ came as a man well yes christ did come as a man but christ also came as a microcosm of all creation so it seems to me that what he's saying is i'm not only taking human nature to myself i am taking all creation to myself to save to heal and to redeem it right so on traditionalist grounds as seeing man as this microcosm of all creation theologically speaking it seems like a like a at least a 
a, a possible logical entailment of the incarnation is that Christ actually will save all creation. And then you see in scripture, whatever this means, all creation is, you know, groaning in labor pains as they await the redemption of the, the sons of God. And I've always thought, like, before I, I, I took this position, I'm like, why is all creation awaiting the redemption of men, right? right. But when you think of it as, well, Christ came as this microcosm of all creation, then somehow it's a good to all creation as well. So yeah. anyway, I'd like to get your thoughts on on that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I can. I'm completely. I, I agree with you, and I'm. I do hold the view that um, that all things will be restored. I just want to make a meta point, and then get into the specific thing you said there about the cosmic dimensions of all this. I think so often, and I get. I get it. I get it on one level. I, I want. I don't want to simply dismiss it, but very often people are afraid of the kinds of things we're talking about, and and the kind of things that I like to say, because they. Because pastorally, basically, they they would they would worry about a kind of presumption or pride. Certainly, the Council of Trent was worried about that. Um, Pius the Tenth was worried about that when he talked about the six you know dimensions of the unforgivable sin. One of them is just, is presumption of salvation. Um, so there's I get it. Um, however, one thing that we have to see as well, and this I do think is a direct result of the incarnation. It should really be there already if you just believe that God created humanity in, in our image, uh, or in his image. Uh, but <clears throat> it's certainly the incarnation where, where, where we say the second person of the Holy Trinity is essentially human in the incarnation. He's not just like kind of human. So now he's bound himself in solidarity with the entirety of humankind. And he calls that potentially that, that entire human race his body, his own body. So that whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. Uh, so there's a direct kind of transference there of now, uh, like a taking on, or what the fathers would call the marvelous exchange. Why I bring this up is because we can quickly, and I'm going to say, quote unquote, Augustinian, because I think Augustine, it's it just depends on where what you're reading of him, in terms of whether or not this is going to be true. This critique I'm going to offer. What you say. Listen, well, we can even do it this way. What you say about someone's kid, you say it reflects on them. Mm -hmm. So when I when mm -hmm. I would say I think God, I don't think God has made a, a single creature, including the angels, including all creation. But even if you wanted to limit the scope to just the human race, he hasn't made a single creature that he does not know and will not eventually bring bring to salvation with himself. That isn't about me. Right. I'm not saying I'm great. <laughs> I deserve everything. I whatever. I'm not. It's not this weird, you know, satanic uh, self-positing, a self sort of assertion, I should say, uh, about how how I deserve and I'm going to demand from God in some kind of extrinsic over and against way that He give me what I want, kind of thing. No, no, no. The whole framing is wrong. It's not love. The framing is. God is good. What God does shows that he's good, just as Christ taught us that the good tree bears good fruit. Mm -hmm. You tell someone's goodness and character by what they do. That isn't different for God. In fact, in certain ways, it's infinitely more true of God because what he is is what he does. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think any qualification add extra is going to change that. Otherwise, you would simply not be able to say anything about God, and you could <clears throat> never judge whether or not God is good or bad, or anything he does is good or bad. But no, he reveals himself, as Christ says in Matthew 7, as a good father who gives good gifts to those who ask him. And, and even more so, his grace superabounds. Anything you expect or say is good, he is that to the infinite degree. Okay, so um, so it's not about me. It's and so this is where I do think like some tr of the accounts of uh, some traditional accounts of hell or eternal conscious torment that you know um, so not just the double predestination but if God just creates a uh, makes a creature that he, he knows where they're going to end up in fact he doesn't just know it ahead of time it's almost as if he sees it eternally instantaneously right uh, but he goes ahead and creates them anyway as Saint Isaac of Nineveh said God is it's not in the nature of divine love to do that. When when Saint Isaac says that, is that him being arrogant? 
No, it's him being confident in God's love and goodness. Mm-hmm. Confidence, faith, and the sense of certitude in that sense, that, that, that's the same faith and confidence that uh, uh, our, our hope is rooted in. And it's the same confidence, by the way, that makes Paul say in Romans 5, hope does not disappoint. Shouldn't somebody stand up and say, well, you don't know that. We'll see. Right. <laughs> we'll see if it disappoints or not. How, how presumptuous of you, Paul, to say it won't disappoint. Um, uh, or or to, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, right, love believes all things, hopes all things. Yep. Right? Is that presumptuous? Well, it, it's not. It could be if it was a different sort of thing. But if it's really of love, no, it isn't. In fact, it's the most appropriate thing, the, ex- the excess of divine love which grace and kindles within us is far, it, it's, could it be farther from uh, presumption and arrogance? It's being enraptured by, by divine goodness. And there's a fixity, a firmness to it, a certainty to it, but it's not the kind that's like, I know everything about math or I'm great at science. It's, I know God is a good father and I, and that's unshakable. So all that to say um, that um, it's not, it isn't really about, us it's about what god with us and through us is making us and him bringing about his will um so back to your point i do think it's for all creatures because his will is for all um and and that's just clear in scripture i mean right it's not like right it's not just the romans five just as death entered through one man so you know life will come to all it's also like you said the romans eight all creation is groaning and yes, they're groaning for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed, that they might be liberated. Yeah. But And so, yes, there's the microcosm point, that somehow it's through humanity, through the rational creature that God becomes, that the whole will be affected. I mean, that's stated explicitly in Ephesians 1. All things in heaven and on earth will be summed up in him, Christ Jesus. Yeah. Um, it's revelation you know you get not just in revelation 21 the easy one where he where says behold i make all things new the former things are past and he says all things not all people um but even earlier in the book in revelation 4 you have the four living creatures swirling around the throne holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and isn't is to come but if you look at each one of those creature represents a type of animal if you look in the context of the first century and in apocalyptic apocalyptic literature it's like it, like there's the domesticated animals one of them like is the face of a bull there's the wild animals the face of a, you know uh there's the human being the face of the rational creature so you get the point is and it's four and in the bible for the four corners of the earth is a cosmic dimension and so the picture in revelation four in the throne the heavenly throne room is all of creation is swirling around the throne of god with, with the lamb and, and the father in the center and through the Spirit, they're giving worship. So the whole intention, the intention for salvation is no more narrow than the intention for creation. Mm. Salvation is the completion of creation. Mm. Of a creation that's fallen and has opposed itself in God, sure. But the effect is completing the work that has begun in Genesis 1. So that's why this Revelation right, 21 ends with a, a hearkening back to Genesis 1 in the garden. It's a garden now with a city. So there's an accomplishment to it, the whole the Jerusalem. But you, you look and you still see a river like you saw in the Garden of Eden. You still see fr- uh, trees and the leaves will be and the fruit will be for the healing of the nations. So you get all this resonance between the beginning and end of the Bible because it's the completion of the, what started here is here in the end. Mm-hmm. So salvation is the completion <clears throat> of creation. It's not some simply juridical thing. It's it's a real act of God finishing his work. And he who began a good work in you will bring it to, to completion, as Paul says. So all that to say, I do believe it's that the uh, restoration of all things, or it might just say the com- final actual completion of all things, uh, is is for all things, just as it says. Um, and I don't think that's like because God in a weird way owes us something as if we were independent, autonomous subjects making a claim on him from afar. But it's because God is good and his intent. He doesn't create anything that he doesn't want to complete. He doesn't start something that he doesn't finish. His word does not return to him void. Uh, but it's through the word and through the spirit that he makes all things. So surely he's going to finish that. Not because yeah, I, Not because I made him, but because... 
that's how he is. Right. And it's not even so you said it's not because God owes us something, um, but it's also not because, like you said, because we're presuming that we will persevere to the end. Right. Actually, what we're saying is even if we don't persevere to the end, God's mercy is infinite, unending, undying, and he will pursue us until the very end when he restores all things to himself. So yes. that, that is that is what I've found to be so compelling about the universalist argument is it really, to me, becomes uh, theology proper, right? Like, it, it really is <laughs> the entire conversation is focused on God. And I have not found um, anything inconsistent with what I understand the church to teach about God in the universalist picture. Sure, I have found some inconsistencies in what the church teaches about hell, right, currently, on paper, which you and I both acknowledge. Um, but then, you know, and by the way, do you have maybe 10 more minutes? Does that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. However long you want, yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to think of where 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 exactly we could we could go with this, because I don't want to drag it on for, for too long, but... Um, There's a, there's a question of, okay, we, we've we've said all that we said. How could this, like, let, let's assume in some dream world of both yours and mine that the, that the church comes to teach <laughs> apocatosis this evening, right? Um, speaking of, like we were of impossibilities earlier, that seems like an impossibility, right? Um, on the basis of even what the church teaches currently. And how the magisterium has functioned since the beginning, right? Um, although it seems to function a little bit, you know, differently now. So <clears throat> I would say, and I'd like to hear yours, my starting point for how we can develop from where we are right now is actually in the scripture passage that passage that you mentioned, that hope does not disappoint. So it seems by everything that I know, that most definitely the church currently does leave as at least permissible, and she seems actually to advocate for the idea that we can hope for the salvation of all. And it seems that the church, and I'm not talking about Balthazar here, I'm talking about the the, the church as representing this view, isn't talking about just uh, a... Uh, uh, like a, a weak hope that's, you know, what we would talk about in daily life. Like, I, I I hope that I get to go to the movies tomorrow, but, you know, the weather might be bad and I won't be able to get there or whatever, right? Seems like the church is talking about theological hope. You know, in the catechism, I think it says, in hope, the church prays that all men will be saved. Um, we in, in the liturgy, we pray for all men to be saved. And I'd imagine that if we're praying, the church is presuming that we're doing so in faith, hope, and love, right? So it seems we are actually permitted to hope. And what the church is saying is that, like, it's not just that we're permitted, it's that it's something in the nature of theological hope to hope for the salvation of all men, right? And so for me, it's okay. If that's established and we can accept that, which some people don't, but um, if that is established, which I believe that it is, then our next step is, okay, so Balthazar said we can hope, but we can't know. Well, if hope doesn't disappoint, right. then I can have confidence that I will not be disappointed for having hoped for the salvation of all, right? Like, right. I understand maybe that seems simplistic, um, but, you know, it does seem to me, and this is the last thing I'll say here, and then I'd like to get your thoughts. And I, by the way, I'm a Catholic as you are. I love the church. And in fact, I've only come to love it more because it's the church's doctrine of God that has made me realize this beauty, right? Right, right. Um, but it does seem to me that there has been, a, and the church has taken this idea that we can't presume anything, perhaps a little too far, right? Because it's not presumption, as you said, it's really about God and his power. But it's like the scriptures do say that hope does not disappoint. 
Love believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Like the scriptural language is actually quite strong. Um, and it seems like that has been weakened in, in yeah. some of the statements of the, of the magisterium. So that's my starting point for the development. Um, but I still don't know. Ultimately, you know, I was talking with someone and, and we, we said, I, I think, and I'd like to hear your perspective on how you hold all things together. That's where I'd like to go with this. But I think that if we get a development, perhaps it could be something like what, you, what you're advocating for, your kind of model. But also it might just be something that right now no one could conceive of, right? And it will just right. come together and we'll see its consistency and its fullness and how it how it uh, has a deep continuity with the tradition and we just never could have dreamt of it, right? Like that's yes. almost what I expect if a development does come. All that said though, I know you have your own model of how you make these, the all, all the relevant um, uh, statements that you think a Catholic has to hold to, like a distinction between purgatory, hell, et cetera. I know you have a model for how you make it work. So I'd like to hear what that is on on your perspective. Yeah, so before I get that specific proposal, it's um, a few quick things to say. Um, wh one is, yeah, I completely agree with everything you you said there. Um, I even, I, I even, I'm with you. Like, as a, as some as a as a, I don't really like to call myself a theologian just because I, I feel like that's an honorific or something. So I'd say, as one who attempts to do theology, um, look, it's a part of the task there. I mean, as Pope Francis has said a million times, he said it last year to the ITC. Um, but but you know, you can you can go to Donum Veritatis or whatever, and there's even moments there where it says. Similar, the theologian has to dare. The theologian has to go beyond. I mean, Francis was very explicit and said, you know, the theologian has to dare to go beyond. It will be the magisterium that will keep him in line or whatever, you know, will step in if necessary. But like part of the task of theology is creative. And I think, to be honest with you, especially in the, in the discourse in, uh, among American Catholics, uh, where everything is, as we all know, polarized, and there's a bunch of internet apologists, and they're fighting this Protestant or that Orthodox or whatever, and then they're fighting each other, and Pope Francis is a heretic. No, he's not. Let's go into the history, blah, blah. Like, um, everything seems to have become about um, putting forth a case which explains everything prior in the tradition uh, the best, and is complete but that's a sort of task of like that that's almost like a, a historical apologetic task which has no sense for the future the present and the future creativity uh that theology must demand i mean i don't i, I really don't mince words about this i and by the way I, neither did vatican ii uh with what it said in day verbum eight it's very clear that the progression goes on until the end of the ages uh, the progression of our knowledge and that it occurs through quote the contemplation of believers and the study of believers and the magisterium but all of those components Ronner was right all of those components are essential it's not like one alone can determine the, the next development they're all essential this is the creativity of the spirit this is i do think the freedom of the spirit and i don't mince words about this if that is not true then the, the truth you're defending um isn't divine because it's not infinite. If it can be closed case in that sort of way, that ahistorical abstract sort of, well, look, I got the mathematical theorem. There's the conclusion. No, end of story. Well, great. You've, you've, you've defended a mathematical theorem, but God isn't that. So um, if you're going to claim that this is divine truth, you've got to be a little more serious about the divinity part um, than it seems like most people are in the, in the discourse. All that to say, um, so I don't think, I don't think a development is an option for Catholics. I don't think it's like one thing you may or may not. I mean, I've seen actual priests and stuff scoff at the very mention of it in this discussion. Right. Oh, oh, he thinks it can just develop or something. Well, do you hold to Vatican II? Right. Um, you don't just think it can. You think it has. And you think it has on some pretty fundamental things. And you think that because you rightly believe, as the uh, uh, early 20th century Catholic tubing theologian, Johann Sebastian Dry said, that the, the tradition is living. Otherwise, what you've done is you've you've uh, you've disinterred 
you know, the bones of, uh, or, or this, like this shed skin of the snake or something of <laughs> the tradition. It's probably not good to compare the tradition to a snake, but Right, um, right. <laughs> you, 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 you know, the sort of form or form that it's kind of that it's kind of moved beyond and you've sort of that you found this fossil and you say this is it. Well, no, we, we don't. You know, God is, is the God of the living, not the dead. So we need to if we're going to if we're going to be, you know, uh, all about the tradition, if we're going to be Catholic and we're going to be rooted in the tradition, that tradition you need to realize is alive. Um, and not only because it's like an organism unto itself, as as St. Newman, you know, John Henry Newman said. But also because it's it's the ongoing incarnation of the Word of God, um, and if anyone's alive, it's Christ. So um, all that to say, I don't think development. I don't think I, I actually get really puzzled by Catholics who scoff at development. I don't think it's an option for you if you're a Catholic. You have to believe in development, or else you have to be dishonest with the entirety of the history of the Church, um, and pretend like things haven't drastically changed even on this exact question. I mean, that's the amazing thing on all this is that so so easily people can sort of scorn the idea of development on this question when they currently hold to a view of hell, which is absolutely the fruit of development. Right. Which someone like an Aquinas would have never imagined. Hmm. Where is Aquinas holding out that all might be saved? Where did right. Augustine hold that maybe all might be saved? Right. Where does where, where does the Council of Origin hold that out? What about the, the Senate of Valence? What about Trent? I mean, what about Vatican One? You know, like what about when uh, Clement, the Pope Clement the Sixth says to the Arminians that unless you express obedience to the Roman pontiff upon your death, you go immediately to the fires of hell. Right. Now you're reading the catechism or now you're reading Vatican Two for that matter. Or John Paul II's Redemptoris Missio that, well, maybe all will be saved. It's a, quote, real possibility, John Paul II said, that all will be saved. That is a development, guys. Right. Or the idea that hell is not about divine retribution and justice. It's about you resisting God to the end. That is not what Trent says. That's a development, guys. So, okay, all to say we should accept in principle the possibility of development because it's happened in fact not only on a lot of other issues, like I think religious liberty, like no salvation of the church, like the dignity of the human person and, and, and what that means for slavery and all, on and on, but because it's happened on this, even this very issue about hell. Okay, so it's it's not something to scoff at or to, to laugh off. This is being Catholic. I'm not saying if you're Catholic, you have to agree with me. I'm just saying that you can't pretend that it's in like by definition absurd to think, any development could occur. Now, to the point you're, that you know, the, the the point at hand though is this. I also agree, and this is something that Carl Reiner said, and I know some people don't like him nowadays. I happen to think he's incredibly good, and most people that scoff at him don't really know what he thinks. Um, but um, he he says explicitly right out. It's a wonderful essay on. It's like in the uh, fourth or fifth volume of Theological Investigations on development of doctrine and dogma. And he makes a point right off the bat that um, development of doctrine, like, by the way, the internal development in Scripture itself, which is a great point that very few exploit, the, the comparison between divine inspired Scripture and its development within itself, and then the, the divinely inspired magi- you know, tradition of magisterium and its development. Okay, why do we not compare those more often? I don't know. But um, he says there is no such thing as a, an adequate abstract theory of development. Exactly for the reasons you said, right? The development, and this has happened time and time again. How do you get from Nicaea to Chalcedon? It is not something that was obvious. This is the last point I'll make about development and then get to a quick sketch of my of my specific uh, proposal or way to model to hold some of this together. Um, and, this is, and it's this, and the point about Nicaea and Chalcedon makes me think of it. Sometimes I think some people, because they kind of know being a post-Vatican II Catholic, you have to allow for development or else you're going to be, you know, running off with uh, um, Lefebvre or something. Um, They'll be like, well, okay, developments can happen. But then they start to pretend as if some sort of it's a unilateral act by fiat of the magisterium in a kind of monarchical way. No. It's always also preceded by a real history. 
Right. The change of the church's teaching on slavery didn't just happen because Leo the Thirteenth was like, hmm, you know, I've been thinking about it. I'm going to go ahead and completely change this to make it intrinsically evil, even though for 500 years we've been justifying it, forms of it in, in, in every, all the way up to 1866, the Holy Office was justifying it and saying that slavery in itself is not evil. Um, which it said to the uh, apostolic vicar, vicar of uh, Ethiopia. So when somebody wants to look it up, um, it's, it's, um, there was a, t there's a whole history of advocates within the church standing up and saying, hold, hold on, we might, we might need to rethink this with their experience in South America and Latin America, with their experience in, in North Africa. The way, seeing the way things are going, seeing the corruption of it all, getting to know the people that are actually enslaved, including Catholics that are enslaved. And it's through this life, the experience, the real synthetic development of like, like God in history, the body of Christ in actual history, that all those interactions, the spirit works through the body of Christ. And that's where development comes from. It doesn't drop out of the sky. All to say is that, I believe, is the context we're in right now on this issue. Mm -hmm. I do not say that the church currently teaches universal salvation. That is objectively false. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. so why, would I, why would I lie about that, right? Right. Um, I do say that I hold universal salvation. That's, that's objectively true. I do. <laughs> um, I don't say that if you don't or if someone else doesn't hold that, that you're that you're a heretic or something. I do say that it will require and that I am hoping and the work and thinking that we do as 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 members of the body of Christ through contemplation and study, as it says in Dei Verbo. These are the, I'm contributing to what I hope will be. And I think you hope will be a development later. Absolutely. That doesn't say anything about the de degree of confidence that I can hold it now, unless I'm out there pronouncing everyone heretics that don't agree with me, which I'm not. So instead, what I'm saying is, can we think through ways to hold together and retain what is essential to the tradition and scripture, and though will have an element of creativity by necessity, of course it will, if it's a real development. I mean, it's got to be creative. Like, you know, for example... No salvation outside the church once upon a time had a very clear meaning, let's say in the 13th century with Benedict, uh, uh, um, or uh, with, uh, sorry, Boniface the Eighth and Clement the Sixth and all of them. But by the time you get to uh, Vatican II and, and, uh, and, and post-Vatican II, all of a sudden it's like, well, it could also mean that those of goodwill are invisibly joined to the body of Christ. I mean, okay, that's creative. That's well, and creative. also, if I can just say just very quickly there, when I read the catechism's explanation of no salvation outside the church, and they, I forget how they say it, but like they, they say restated in this way, it means X, Y, Z. Yes, right. I read it and I thought, wow, there is, it was like masterful and it was a very perceptive continuity, right? Yes. So, so even that, but then it's okay. At what level is it a continuity? It it is, and you've talked exactly. about this. It's at a deeper level than just these surface statements. So sorry. Like, go, go ahead. To to the point where look, and I I just do have to say this just to be honest as a Catholic, and I'm not going to lie about stuff. Do I think that Boniface the Eighth had in his mind <laughs> what JP two says in Redemptoris Missio? No. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Just like looking at the evidence, looking at what everyone was saying, and like from thir uh, 1302, especially that statement, the bull there, right? And then, but you can look at all the correspondence with the Arminians, right? All that stuff. Okay. It's, I know. I don't think there's a case. No, I don't think that's the kind of continuity we're talking about. Like, and you're not talking about that. It's not the kind of continuity that's like, oh, yeah, that's just always what everyone intended. We just kind of didn't quite understand them. No, no, no. But you know what? Look, Boniface the Eighth is not the primordial intender of the church. It is Jesus Christ. Okay. So the question is, what is God's intention? Yes, that has to be mediated. Of course, I'm a Catholic. I think it has to be mediated through the church. I think I'm mediated through, through the sacraments. I think it's mediated through, you know, a, the catechesis of, you know, uh, your aunt, whoever, who showed you this rosary and, you know, or, or those, you know, play the, Pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, right? And what does it say? For the for the mercy of the whole world, right? Not my sense, sense of the whole world. 
uh, salvation of the whole world. Um, okay, so all that to say, of course, I think it has to be mediated, but that's really, but like you said, it's at a deeper level. Now, people, Catholics balk at that because of Vatican I. It specifically warns against this. It says, you know, by appeal, by quote unquote appealing to some more profound meaning, you know, we we resist this sort of, you know, claim of innovation. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, if you're if you're also still Catholic, <laughs> right now, you have to look at Fides et Ratio. You've got to look at Vatican II. You you even do have to look at Donum Veritatis, which all of them admit that there not only there can be a deeper meaning, but that there has to be, if this is divine revelation. And, and you know, Ratzinger. When he's the head of the CDF, he even says that there's no way to objectify the word of God in a system. So this is partly what constantly goes right. So all that to say, right, again, I don't think you can be Catholic and scoff at the idea of development. You're committed in principle to it, buddy. You know, so um, but the other thing is, OK, so the specific really quickly, I know now I have to say, too, is just as a little anecdote um, to, to something that uh, you said. Once I was I was on retreat as, as this really nice Catholic small little sanctuary by the river Mississippi River, and um, and there's a priest that comes there. It's a really small thing. It's run by lay people now. You, once upon a time, there's Benedictine, but you know they had just they had to get uh, to leave. But um, there was a fairly um, I would say he was a rector, a former rector of a fairly conservative seminary, um, and. Um, he was there doing spiritual direction and confession and stuff. And so I, I met with him and I talked to him about a lot of this stuff, actually. And I was like, look, I just have this belief and I can't shake it. And it affects my spiritual. And it was so interesting. He, he told me to, to pray the divine mercy chaplet. And then he said, he said, look at Romans five, five. He's the one who pointed me to hope does not disappoint. And uh, it was sort of a wink and a nudge, you know, of like, yeah, I can see what you're doing here, and 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 it's not out of out of balance or whatever. So, all that to say, um, when it comes to me trying to hold together or to see how this stuff can make sense, um, I do two things quickly. One is um, you have to understand, like you said, there's no question there's been development on this on this topic, as we've already said. There's even been development on, say, the magisterial interpretation of uh, of the passages in Peter and Timothy. They talk about God willing all to be saved and that none should perish. Come in. Because, okay, we had a lot of saints that did not interpret it as that's God's absolute desire. They would qualify it away as like, well, I mean, he desires the salvation of the elect. It's just not mentioned there or whatever. It's, it's not qualified, but you got to go elsewhere. Augustine would put it that way. Um, Aquinas would. Well, the current catechism doesn't. It says what you said, which is, right. no, that's God's desire. Straight out, unilaterally. Um, okay, so that's that's also another development, but um, but um, that I think we have to hold. And as Pope Francis quoted an earlier theological commission, um, that in in any proposal, the, the divine mercy has to has to be given the its due weight and has to superabound. Um, and he he said he said or else that proposal isn't plausible. That's actually the the commission's language. Um, but so okay, God's absolute desire for the salvation of all. His absolute willingness to do anything for that, as evidenced by the incarnation, holy, you know, in in, uh, in the tritium. Um, and then I think when you turn and say, well, okay, what is the church has, what has the church been concerned about when it's resisted the implications of those sorts of things? I see two things immediately, and actually JP two pointed them out already pretty clearly. One is what we've already mentioned with like Trent or wherever else or Pius X or whoever is presumption, like spiritual pastoral on the individual level. If you if you think you are going to heaven, then, you know, even if you think it's not doesn't mean it gives you a blank check to do whatever you want. Nevertheless, it sort of cheapens. I don't know how this could be true, but let's just say it is. It cheapens the sort of weight of human decisions. I'm not sure why you need the threat of eternal suffering for anything to matter, but that's a different question. Um Seems to me like just having to, you know, uh, be reconciled with God is enough work that would make right. everything worth worthwhile. And God Himself seems to be sufficiently beautiful that He doesn't need anything else to to make Himself attractive. But um, but then there's, but the so okay, but I get, but there that's a real. T I mean, and in, in church fathers, and even some of the church fathers that did hold to universalism, still had this sense of well, you got to be kind of careful with how you say that or if you even say it to the masses because it could encourage a sort of laxity okay so that's one concern presumption laxity license 
The other concern, which JP2 points out, again, in Redemptoris Missio, is um, he says that we have to hold two things, that the real possibility of the salvation of all, and secondly, that that's connected to the church. That's the other thing I think the tradition has very much been, and that's the charitable way, by the way, to read some of the claims in, say, the 13th, 14th century about the papacy. It's a charitable way to read, to say there's this concern for unity, the unity of, of, of the church and ultimately of the human race and ultimately of all the crea- all creation. To say, let's not make it such an individualistic affair in response to the Re- Reformation that, you know, you're like, well, I'm really certain I'm going to heaven and you, and so we can just sort of have nothing to do with each other because we're all going different paths and whatever. So there's no central central sort of, centri- you know, cent- force of gravity in the church itself as it necessary. Okay, even the development of uh, salvation outside the church says that, you know, the person is invisibly connected or linked to the body of Christ. So there is still that necessity of the body of Christ. So I hold to that, all of that. And then, and then, so the question then becomes, well, what about all these, you know, statements about, like, say, the distinction, like you said, between hell and purgatory? So here's the kind of most creative part of the way I would want to um, unfold uh, the case at more length, you know, at, at some point is um, I don't think we've sufficiently taken uh, into account the New Testament's own language about how sin divides the subject, the sinner. Mm-hmm. This is Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. This is Colossians 3, 10. Um, sin isn't just you sort of breaking the law. It's you becoming the wrong human. Paul calls it the ancient man. The ancient human being. And then he says in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, put off, cast away the old human being, the old person, and put on the image of Christ. And you will be, as he says in Ephesians kind of boldly, created then according to God's, through through justice and, and uh, righteousness, according to God's in, like intention. Um, God's intention for creation is Christ. That is the image of God. You're made according to the image of God. That is to say, you're made according to Christ. And so when you when you cast off what you've made of yourself and you conform yourself to Christ, you are becoming truly created, which is to say saved, preserved. That's what the word saved means. Preserved, made whole, complete. Um, and so I think that the distinction between hell and purgatory could be understood speculatively to uh to be reflecting that fundamentally absurd yet real uh fission uh, fissure division separation even between um the old person and the true person I mean, paul talks about right i have been crucified with christ and i no longer live uh, but but the life i now live i live through christ who lives in me so there's two eyes or two laws at work in my, I perceive what I would do, you know, what I, what I don't want to do, that's what I do, right? What I do want to do, the very thing I don't do. So there's this interior war. It's not just, oh, I knew the law and I broke it. Okay, what's the penalty? Hopefully, oh, I can't pay that. Christ will help me pay that or something. No, it's like when you send, it's, it's actually in a way far more um, serious than that. It's... Um, You've incarnated something that God Himself didn't even want to make, or like doesn't intend mm-hmm. to create, and that has to be destroyed. Then you can start to bring back in a lot of the New Testament language of which often the images are of annihilation, you know, the destruction of the the straw and the kiln, uh, you know, those that are that, that are that are uh, totally destroyed, you know, especially like in the Book of Revelation, they're totally destroyed many times. Um, and, and perhaps so, even perhaps even you're both the sheep and the goat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Which was a which is in the church fathers that that's a not an uncommon thing, uh, a way to interpret Matthew 25. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, but th- that division runs through you. And what you can do is you become the sort of like salvation. The process of grace working through you is you coming to be able to say with Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. Right. And yet he's totally confident in Christ that he's saved. Mm-hmm. Right, and somehow both of those are true. And it's funny to me. I've said this before. We we say a lot about the fundamental absurdity of evil itself. I mean, the, the, like God doesn't make evil 
evil isn't a thing in itself to be made, and yet we do realize it. We, we give ourselves to realize it to some degree. Um, and we realize that's a fundamentally absurd, almost, um, you know, uh, a totally, um, like, an, it's a total indulgence of illusion. It's a complete and total error of the worst kind. Um, and yet we, we like, so we recognize all this, you know, Augustine's going to say that evil isn't a cause, it's a deficient cause, and he's going to contact, there's no origin of evil in that sense. And yet, when we come to, like, the resolution to how is God going to ultimately deal with evil, we pretend like it's all neat and there's really no absurdity anymore. You either are completely evil and damned or you're going to heaven, and that's it. And it's like, no, I mean, you sin has created something that the New Testament calls the old, the ancient human being, which does need to be destroyed forever. Eternally destroyed. It's, and yes, you, insofar as you identify yourself with that thing, that image, that false image that you brought into being through yourself, through your own sin, insofar as you still identify yourself with that, it will be as if you are in hell. Because you're identifying yourself to the thing that is destined for eternal destruction and perdition. But insofar as, as through grace, right, through the sacrament, through the work of Christ, you are separated more and more to, from that fundamental delusion into coming to see and be who you truly are, then you will be able to see that that was false all along. And you'll be conformed, as Colossians 3 says, conformed to the image and the recognition of the Creator. And then he, it says in Colossians 3, it says, then there will be no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, but Christ is and is in all. That's what that says in verse 11. Okay, so if that's, that's the picture here, then I would want to say, you know, Balthazar, by the way, is someone who has this category as well. He, he talks about the unusable residue in Theodrama 5, the unusable residue of sin that, needs, that can only be discarded. There's no use to be made of it. So that is the destination ultimately, or the, the, the occupants, so to speak, of hell or that, the discarded unusable residue. The thing I used to identify myself with so closely that it was an utterly painful experience to be separated from that, but it was for my sake all along. And yet, those that are purged, I mean, that's not the same thing as, as purgatory, because purgatory is an aspect of heaven itself. You're already that you're being purged and you're moving towards full union and beatific vision with God. And that's a fundamental division between hell and purgatory. It, can I ask a question there? Does it, it seems to me like on your on this model which i'm <clears throat> i've ever since i heard you say it a while back on larry chap's podcast i thought about it and thought about it and i i i can't say that i can 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 hold to it but i think it's just because it's something that um is so foreign to me but that's why i've held on to it because i'm like I know I probably have some modern conception of the self that's like not as weighty and beautiful and just profound as what you're saying. So I have held and thought on and thought about it and so forth. So I don't reject it. It's just something I can't fully wrap my mind around at this time. But anyways, it sounds like what you're saying is almost in purgatory. And tell me if this is wrong. This is my kind of jumping to conclusions. But in purgatory, the division between the false self and the true self has already happened but the damage done by the fall by the false self to the true self is what is what is being repaired in purgatory to make you whole complete entire yeah. whereas uh i guess well yeah is that what purgatory would be is a division already done at that point and it's healing so, the self from the the <laughs> impact of the false self so I think it's it's both it's two things at once that again, and this is what's so hard. There's two reasons why I think we haven't really thought about all this stuff yet in, in theology, and certainly not in, the, in like our teaching and, and doctrine. One is because is just conceptually this is almost by design. It's so difficult, right? But it's also no more uh, absurd than God creating creation, which is almost immediately riddled by total evil and failure. That seems absurd. Um, like where did that come from? Right, is the is the always the question of the Odyssey and stuff. So, so the absurdity is there for everyone. We just have to deal with it in different ways. But, um, but um, so what I want to say is that the division. There's two things going on. So, like when you sin, it's not just that you failed. Like we usually say sin, we we do the 
textbook definition of sin, the Greek miss word. Oh, it means to miss the mark. It means to like, yeah, you miss the target. But it also means you, it's almost like the, the more profound sense is uh, you miss the mark, but in your the very act of missing it, you almost create a new target that's an illusion. Mm. So there's two things that sin does. It doesn't just divert you from the true way. It also creates a false way mm. and false ends. Because the whole thing is, is Maximus, Evagrius, uh, Origen, St. Isaac, the whole Philokalia tradition, all of them will say very clearly that ignorance is fundamentally the, the mother of all vice. Um, so, so that's what sin is doing. And so what I'm trying to say is the judgment, which has the aspect of hell and the aspect of purgatory, is that very division is itself a result, an ongoing even result of the work of judgment itself. Like the division itself isn't like a conceptual division because sin itself isn't like a conceptual division. It's right. a false judgment. And so this is the judgment of false judgment in such a way that the very distinction between hell and purgatory is partially the result and partially the ongoing condition of the work of purgatory. Because there's two problems you're trying to remedy. One is the destruction of the false way and in that you yourself have made. And not just, by the way, it's not just one, because the nature, quote unquote, nature of sin is fragmentation. So you've done it a million times. Right. And so it's it's a mess conceptually. It's a mess. The whole so that's the thing. We we typically think of the person as like a monad and you're good or you're bad. And but but basically your core is unaffected. Well, that's a really simplistic individualistic way to think of the person. The person's far more paradoxical. Uh you're because it's incarnating its own images. And and so anyway, I'll all to say but that means it can be torn apart from within itself in its delusion. That's very. That's the most common way that, say, Saint Maximus describes sin: is fragmenting all of nature through our own, as he says, uh, individual private errors and wanderings. It like pulls apart what God is trying to hold together from Genesis one. All to say, right, that um, that um, that's one thing. You, if you're going to reverse that or say heal that or remedy that, you have to destroy the false way and the false end. But that has to be a simultaneous, yes, paradoxical, but simultaneous process with also then realizing the true way. Right. And those are two distinct dimensions, or I don't know, like here words start to get difficult, but dimensions or aspects or um, sides or motions of the same one judgment. And so the very distinction between the, purga, purga, uh, the purgatorial self, you might say, and the, and the infernal self is itself the work of divine judgment. And because the distinction had gone so fundamental to the center, it looks like an absurdity on the face. Mm -hmm. But that's because it always really, in a sense, was an absurdity on the face, yet you still realized it anyway in yourself. I think otherwise we're basically not taking the New Testament language seriously at all. Right. And and that is why, like I said, I've I it's when I said like I can't hold this position, it's not like, oh, I think it's wrong. It's, right, it's, right, right, it's, right, right. It's that I literally like, couldn't comprehend, and I had to say to myself, well, yeah, like Scripture does have this language of division, and perhaps this is a way of thinking about it. And um, yeah, and 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 again, like I'm sure you acknowledge, maybe the development goes another way. This is your proposal, yes. right? Right. Yeah, and it's not. There um, are other. There. Are, I should just quickly say, like, there are other ways you could you could say I want to be a Catholic and a Universalist and make this not inconsistent and not do this. I mean, you could do. Right. You could do. Uh, I've seen people do like relative degrees of eternity, which which is a medieval idea. It's not a new thing. Uh, so you could say, no, no, like some people go to hell, eternal hell. And that that isn't the same thing as heaven, which which has an aspect of purgatory. And uh, it's just that the there is no such thing as an absolute eternal unless that's God. And right. so even what's eternal to one to one degree uh, fr from one perspective, like in one age, uh, is not as for that reason unending in like a series sense it could just be it's finite but its ends are imperceptible and so to us it looks eternal right there's a way to do it that way you could do you could do other ways you could you could um you know uh, I, i've seen a variety of options so yes i'm not saying that this is the only way this whole right. thing makes sense i just do think it is a basically untapped what i like about this is that 
it actually has very deep re- roots in scripture and in i have to say especially the eastern not only but especially the eastern tradition right um so and 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 also i think just it it gives a a weight to the human person that sometimes we don't recognize like the way what keeps coming to mind as you're saying this is it's like do we really and I, this is such a poor way of wording it but do we really have such such dynamic spiritual energy that we can incarnate false selves i mean it's like that's like a that's a really profound and um in a way like I, it's not good that we can incarnate false selves but it's like god has given given us such like again dynamic spiritual energy so as to that's even a possibility right, right so right um okay well we've gone on for for quite some time so we'll <laughs> we'll we'll wrap up here in a minute i guess i you know i hate to say this but i i have to just say at the end like i think i just have to make some qualifications which is annoying but people are you know i know because i i so I, I don't I'm not sure that you know this, Jordan, but I once was very traditionalist um in the in the standard sense that, that you think about it. Um and uh and so I know that this is thought of as something that is um heretical, um, that I am perceived as uh, by some as not being a Catholic for it, um, or as by others as seriously mistaken, but still striving to be Catholic. Um, but in one way or another kind of people take a even if unintentionally kind of a condescending attitude to attitude toward people who believe this so i guess i'd say this i don't know precisely how uh to to make this all work um i am i i am convinced to my core and i couldn't give you all the reasons but that it is okay for me to be a catholic and for me to be a universalist and i'll just say it even further for me to believe in the final restoration of all things um i believe that on the basis as i said of what the church teaches about god and if god is the fundamental reality if god is reality itself i feel maybe perhaps i shouldn't put it this way but i feel justified in in saying that that's why i believe this um I am not particularly, if if one is to consider this liberal, I'm not particularly liberal on on anything else. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'll, although on some people's account I am, you know, I I more or less hold to anything that's taught post Vatican II, right? So like, um, and I don't really quibble with it if it is something that you know, say on any hot button issue is considered to be liberal, right? And in fact, I think some of those like natural moral law truths and so forth that people are going to think oh well if if you you know um uh if you believe in universalism then you're going to doubt all the other things on all these hot button issues well those are that's not to say that i don't think we can kind of in some sense know the end and and that all will be saved but i i also think those natural moral truths that we we know by our participation and you know the mind of god which is essentially what natural law is i think they're just less mysterious and straightforward and so i actually more easily accept them right and so i i had to make those qualifications because um and it's not perfect and some people are going to say they're going to go to all the scriptural statements that we didn't touch on and the condemnation of apocatosis at constantinople too if that's in fact true and all of that right um and i get that i'm open to people uh uh saying all that i understand why they're saying all that i would just ask you know anyone who's who listens to this which i have 10 subscribers so maybe no one will um (laughs) anyone who listens to this to just give myself and jordan the benefit of the doubt and 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 uh uh of seeing that you know, we're we're striving to base this upon Catholic principles and teaching. And, and in fact, my spiritual director, who disagrees with me on this, he's only a hopeful universalist, Balthazarian. Um, I, I told him, I said, I can I receive communion believing this? Can I am I a Catholic? Because this is when I was a lot more concerned about it. And he said, Listen, he said, you are striving to think with the church and doing this. Like 
you yeah your position is contrary to the the current teaching of the church but everything you're saying like has its basis in what you understand catholic teaching to be so at, at the very least i would hope people would um would take me up uh or or again give me the benefit of the doubt of seeing it in that way and give you the same and obviously you're uh 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 yeah, I know you said you don't like theologian, but you're a theologian and, and far more educated on these matters. And, 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 you know, people have to take that into consideration as well. And what Don and Veritatis said about theologians, I think you even pointed out, even can, if they're recognized as being in dissent, could be suffering for the truth, right? They, like there's, and, and I like to just think that I can kind of, I'm not a theologian myself, but on the basis of other theologians' opinions, I can kind of, you know, jump in and say, well, I, I also hold to this because um, someone of uh, who's who's done the work holds to it, and I think that the work is uh, is well done. Um, last thing I'd say, and sorry to go on, Jordan, but this is something I just wanted to share with you because I've I've heard you share it before, and it's a little kind of far afield of everything we've been saying. But you you've talked about Saint, I think it's Saint Teresa Benedict of the Cross, and how mm. she talks about how. Um, you know, uh, it, she asks, is it possible that even one soul will not be saved? And she says, you know, uh, in principle, we have to hold to the yes. reality of this on the basis of uh, uh, or the the possibility of this on the basis of human freedom. But she says, in reality, it, she doesn't say it will become, but it, it can become an infinite improbability, um, yeah. which two things there. One. There's no such thing as an infinite improbability. <laughs> but two, I wanted to share this because I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. And I, I just realized it has even maybe a more profound meaning than I've also, uh, often thought. But you made the point in talking about this. OK, in principle versus in reality. And even you say, sure, you can accept it in principle, but yeah. there's a reality. Right. Well, but I want to just point as, out, just as just as real fast, I would accept that in principle, uh, God can't be born of a woman. Right. Right, right. God can't die. Right. What, 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 I mean, if, as long as we mean by in principle, the way that like sort of according to our concepts abstractly, abstractly, what is or isn't possible given the kind of thing we're talking about. That's what it usually in principle means, like in, inherently in the kind of thing we're speaking of. It has these limits or whatever. Then we should all at least be able to admit that in principle, in that sense, now, of course, the, the the great revelation of Christianity is that the principle himself is a person and infinitely personal and is triune with the Father and the Spirit so that the true principle doesn't map onto what we perceive in principle. Right. And that's in some ways why, why you know, Christ is, uh, what does St. Paul says, like he's foolishness to the Greeks, right? Yes. Not yes. just because he died on a cross, which is the context of that passage, but also because he became incarnate, right? And he's right. supposed to be this... Yeah, the, the absolutely incorporeal mind, right? Right, right. right. Um, uh, but I, I did want to say, so there's this distinction between in principle and in reality. And there's there's this thing that Pope Francis has been saying throughout his papacy, which now to me has so much more meaning, which is reality is greater than ideas. Yes. And um, I wanted to, to kind of end there. So I, I think um, if we understand God to be reality then of course reality is greater than ideas and all of our ideas have to be assessed against the reality that is god so and then one last thing i'll add to close as well it's a little bit sure. of an appeal to fellow catholics just given some of the stuff you were saying um reality is always greater than any idea um and as the past two pontificates also were already saying the reason for that is Christological, that the truth is not an idea. It's, it is a person who says, I am the truth. You know, two plus two equals four doesn't say about itself, I am true. <laughs> right. It, it doesn't have a first person perspective or a second or third, much less the combination of the three, which makes it a person. Um, and so... You, this, though, does kind of open up a different dimension. And I have to say this. I just want to say this. I want to share it. To people. Again, you can take, you know, take my word for it or whatever. I don't know. I mean, you can give me the benefit of the doubt or not. I get messages almost weekly 
from people who are range, ranging from who are just very much struggling kind of intellectually with being a Catholic and a universalist, all the way down to who are people who are in turmoil. And it's always the same sorts of kind of questions, not maybe not as always intellectually as set up as the way you you did this, but there, there's a very because the reality because the reality itself is not just some idea or theory, uh, but is ultimately faces actual people. In other words, it's actually the knowledge that we have through love that Paul speaks about in First Corinthians thirteen, which is beyond if we can fathom all mysteries, but have not love, I'm nothing. So you get something in in love, a kind of knowledge, an interpersonal knowledge between God and creation that you can't get by fathoming all fathoming all mysteries over here. And so, but this is the same. Re- I, I point this out because it's the same reason why these messages, these people that are sending messages, or I myself, I presume maybe maybe you, um, it also becomes a deeply existential question. Yes, it has absolutely. to do with uh, you, and you alluded this earlier. It has to do with whether. It has to do with my actual relation to the God that I worship and love and whether or not I can believe in him. I don't say that's true of everyone. I'm not saying if, you, if you're right, not right. a universalist, you, you're, you, know, you, you haven't thought through like whether or not or you don't have true faith or something. I'm just saying that for a lot of people, and I think this isn't going to slow down, it's going to get more and more prevalent. I think so, too. Yeah. This is not just like some academic game. Um, it fundamentally has to do with how I can pray. Yep. It fundamentally has to do with what I believe about the church and wh- whether I can stay in the church, say, through scandal or whatever else, or this world who's presenting all, a whole bunch of different options. And It has so much to do with the fact that we are entering a time, and I've already been in a time, where probably, you know, lo- Balthazar said, love alone is credible. The only thing that will ultimately triumph in terms of the truth of the gospel will be its inherent truth, attractiveness, goodness, and come up persuasion which the early father said is the reason why god was incarnate was was not to lord over or to be a tyrant but to persuade um and so have some patience with people that are struggling with this this isn't just a sign of rebellion Mm -hmm. this is a sign i would suggest for very many of these people of a more profound and deepening faith absolutely Yep. And you know what? That's that's why and I will have to end it here. My wife actually just came in a second ago. You can't see from the background, but um, that's why. I, so I had a conversation with a friend of mine recently who 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 agrees with me, but um, who was like, I just I'm not sure you want to make this the, the drum that you beat and um, and uh, uh, like a hill that you'll die on. And I said. I do want to make it that um, yeah. because I actually think it's central to the gospel. Um, and I think that it is a profoundly, as you said, existential question that affects uh, people's you know, faith lives very profoundly, um, and that it's what some people need to continue in the life of faith. And like you said, perhaps not all, right? Um, and I'm not judging how some could uh, perceive God as loving without believing as, as you or I do. So again, perhaps not all, but I think a lot, and I think that it's 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 a way of you know, let's say proclaiming liberty to the captives. Um, yeah. So, in any case, Jordan, really appreciate your time. I did not mean to go two hours, but I really appreciate you being generous with your time. And uh, uh, to the listeners, thank you. Um, I'm just getting into this, so I forgot to say for my last couple episodes, like and subscribe if you uh, enjoy it, and um, appreciate everyone's time. So thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Sean.